Check one, two. Check. Check one, two. We're good, Lee. You were good, Lee. Exactly. So I'm having, with Deborah, we're, we're like mapping the big picture, and then I want to dive in and say like, you know, like the State Department has now a national implementation plan. I've gone through and picked out things that look more significant, and I want to get details and also confirm that there isn't other stuff that, you know. Yeah, I can definitely talk to you about it from the USA and if things are happening to you guys about things. Yeah. 
all I know. What can you study? It's also one of the areas we study. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Although, I mean, um, our studies are Yeah, how was that? Uh, you must have enjoyed that, being able to, uh, was it was quite to, to, to travel like that. Yeah. yeah. But I think what I was doing about it was, um, well, the linkages were very micro community type things to generic um, you know, global concepts. And, uh, Scholars from those countries when you went yes. to Yes. Yeah, but But you can always pick it yeah. up. Yeah. Mm, I hope I can be facing the room and keep my You're going to Bogota. How long are you going to be in Bogota? Who will you be with? No, you know, we're going to who had a fair amount to do with Bogus with Colombia. Mm. Uh, one of them oh very God, Ethan, it's so nice to see you from Colombia. Oh, very oh, delicious. Allison, is it Mela Champ? Uh, Mela Champ? Yeah. Yeah. Mela Champ? Yeah. 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 Actually, he's right now in Washington. Virginia. I'm going to take good notes of your presentations because I'm going to be distracted. This is the thing when you're on a panel, you know, <laughs> you're interested good luck. in what the other people are saying, and then you, I, I get so distracted with my own stuff. You say something, and I don't get to follow up on it. So for the for the PowerPoint, um, I just slide over there and what? Yeah, you can use either the computer one or this. But and then how are they? Are they all queued up in order? Do we have to find them? They're here. So yours is brisk. And then this is yours, right? Yes, mine. And that's Caroline's, yeah. It's just at the bottom here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit, Allison. I'm gonna sit right there so I can jump up. Let's do push. No, your brain space just goes to other things. No, I'm, I'm a real absent-minded professor. I concentrate very hard, and you know, I can, I can drive. I can, you know, microwave food. You should hear my children complain terribly that <laughs> mom is a space. <laughs> I manage to raise children without being very um, but, <laughs> but I know I know my limits, you know. <laughs> so I was very interested in, in particularly your work on on the you know, I have some experience there. Mm. And um, in fact I was just there in December. Um, uh, one of the children that I raised without injuring lives there now. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Santiago was not very violent, and um, in, 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 
as a contract case. But then you feel this that's a very different real estate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which means it's well, it's the thing about like perception. Exactly, perception of violence and uh, the issue about uh, visibility of violence as uh, violence. Right. It's kind of spaces right. and kind of right. 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 I mean, it gave us a whole some new insights, new right. things that we're going to talk about that we're quite excited about. One of my places I feel that Yeah. Well, there is such both what I believe in my own personal, you know, I'm part of the Nazi Party and Nazi The convenience yeah. of violence in the community, the, yeah. the, the building kind of experience that we talked about in the past, and it's only addressed when it's convenient. Well, yeah. But that's not yeah. for the experts. Yeah. 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 And, and people will uh, maintain. Good afternoon. We'll get started in a couple minutes. We have some colleagues who are still grabbing some lunch. So just in a couple minutes, we'll get started. There's a free seat here, There's a, if anyone needs a seat. Seat here. There are a couple of seats here, if anyone is looking for a seat. A couple of free seats up here if anyone is. A couple of free seats up here also. Well, good afternoon and welcome. What a great turnout. My, my colleague from USAID, Charlie Snyder, was saying, this is pent-up demand from snow and a long weekend. 
Yes, it's great, great to see such a wonderful turnout uh, for, for our event today. I'm Roger Mark D'Souza, the Director of Population, Environmental Security and Resilience here at the Wilson Center, and welcome to our discussion on urbanization and insecurity, crowding, conflict, and gender with four of our best friends and colleagues, Rich, Allison, Caroline, and Alfred. And I, I also want to say to you, welcome to what we call our intellectual candy shop. <laughs> this, is, this is how my boss, the president and, and CEO of the Wilson Center, Jane Harmon, this is how she describes the Wilson Center, as an intellectual candy shop where you don't get fat on spin. <laughs> You might get fat on the desserts, but not on spin. So welcome. And as many of you know, we are a living memorial to President Wilson and to his legacy. And in his legacy, we bring together analysis, policy, and practice. And I also want to say a happy birthday to our program, the Environmental Change and Security Program. We've just celebrated our 20th uh, birthday. So happy birthday to us. And I know many of you know us through our blog, The New Security Beat, at blognewsecuritybeat.org. I can t uh, encourage you to continue to visit the blog. We are together today as part of our HELPS project. Help stands for Health, Environment, Livelihoods, Population, and Security. And this is a five-year effort that's generously supported by USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. As we go into our discussion today, I just wanted to let you know that the event is being webcast live. So welcome to those of you who tune in to us through the webcast. And when we get to the discussion, we'd like to ask you to use a microphone. I, we have colleagues who will come around to you with the microphone, and we'll ask you to um, use the microphones and introduce yourself and your affiliation. So now I'd like to hand it over to a longtime friend and, and colleague, Dr. Richson Carter, who is a demographer in residence at the Stimson Center, and who is a, and for us, we're very proud to say that he's a Wilson Center Global Fellow affiliated with our program. So, Rich? Thank you very much, Roger Mark, and uh, welcome to the Wilson Center, both for the, uh, those people in the, our immediate audience, our physical audience, and also uh, in the, at the internet sites. Um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd just like to start uh, by, by recounting a little bit of um, my own experience with urbanization. That's the topic if you're here for uh, a, 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 a seminar on urbanization and security, then you're in the right place. Uh, Oh, about four years ago, uh, my, my boss at the National Intelligence Council, where I was working at the time, assigned me the topic of, uh, of urbanization and wanted to know more about the politics of that and what, what the future lies, uh, what lies in the future for, for urban uh, spaces. And he thought that a demographer should know it all. It's a demographic topic. The more rapid population is growing, the more rapid the urbanization, uh, the urban population is growing in, the, uh, in that country. And there are a lot of demographic qualities, and we can look into the, to the future using demography, but uh, I miserably failed at that task. I had to go ask somebody else and, and gather some uh, McKinsey and other scholars to really look at, at what's happening in, in, in today's cities and think about what will happen in the future because um, it's just a, it has, it, first of all, I think it's under-theorized, that's my opinion. It's under-theorized and there's a potential for a great deal of theorization uh, to guide us. And there just is, um, there's a lot of things happening in, in all different social science and physical science realms in urbanization that demographers just can't handle. So with that, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'd like to introduce people who uh, I think can handle it far better than I, I did. Um, and uh, we're very lucky to have three of those type of people right in front of us. Um, I'll start. Uh, I'll start with uh, uh, with uh, Alfred Omenya at the far right, who will be our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Dr. Omenya is currently a principal researcher and man managing director of EcoBuild, an organization that undertakes basic and applied research in housing urban and environmental issues and assistant policy and program formulation. 
uh, Dr. Omenya's uh, career path in Kenya has led him through academic, nonprofit, and private sectors. And he has recently completed a four-city comparative study on urban violence called the Urban Tipping Point Project. And that will be a basis of many of his remarks today. Uh, Allison Brisk is currently a, a fellow at the Wilson Center, although she hails from the University of California at Santa Barbara, where she is the Mellichamp Professor of Global Governance. Allison is author and co-author of 10 books on a rich variety of human rights, politics, and policy. I tried to go through a bunch of those titles and look at some of this before, but it was quite <laughs> daunting. And um, Dr. Brist can also, I, and I, I, I give her a lot of credit here, can also boast a, a remarkable record of uh, overseas academic experience. And I won't, I'll just say it's almost on every continent except Antarctica. Almost, I think on the, Amer the Americas, Europe, yep. Asia, it was. Yep. Australia. You're just missing. The, you're just missing the Middle East, I think, right? For Middle East, North Africa, but who can blame you? Um, <laughs> so, because I have a Middle East, Middle East experience, and and it can be rough at different times. Um, uh, her most recent study is in, in analysis of communications politics in two dozen human rights campaigns, which, when published uh, by Oxford Uni University Press, will be entitled. Speaking rights to power, and that should come out soon. It, it's actually come out in. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and there was uh, an event here at the Wilson Center, and if anybody wants uh, oh, to okay. get it, I can, I I can help corrected. facilitate that. Yeah. Great, great. And <clears throat> last but not least, Dr. Caroline Wanjiko Kihato is a senior research fellow at the School of Architecture and Planning at the University of Witwatersand. Strand. I always get that. I find it difficult with water, 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 water strand. Should, I thought there should be a T in there. Her career has involved both teaching and research in academia and, in the, and, and work in the nonprofit sector in South Africa. Caroline has authored and co-authored a long list of articles and, and books on a variety of urban topics. And I did read a few of her shorter pieces, and I was I, I love them. They were they're excellent. Her latest focus is on uh, is on has been on land tenure and transactions in peri-urban settlements. But she's got another book that just came out too as well. That's on migration and development, right? Is yeah. that one? Yeah. In, Johannesburg. in 2011, Dr. Kihata received a MacArthur Award for her work on migration and development. After which she spent a year in our fair city in D.C. as a visiting scholar at the Institute for the Study of International Migration at Georgetown University. So what we'll do, I think, is uh, we've got three people who could spend a lot more than the 20 minutes I'm going to give them talking about this topic. But we'll hold them to 20 minutes. And I've got my little card here, <laughs> which I'll pass around. And, um, and then we'll have uh, an open discussion afterwards where you can flesh out many of the details. So uh, Alfred, would you like to start? Yes. Is that giving you problems? I'm almost there. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Roger Mark and, uh, and, and, and Richard for those uh, wonderful remarks and fellow panelists and the Woodrow Wilson Center. This is the second time I'm, uh, I'm uh, hung around Washington, DC. Last time it was a bit warmer. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, um, uh, I think uh, I'm a man of all seasons. Uh, <laughs> I can survive the snow. Um, the presentation I'll, I'll make is really um, a little bit of highlights of, uh, of gender issues and a much broader uh, international study on violence. It was called the Tipping Point of Urban Violence uh, that um, was a four-city study um, involving Nairobi, Kenya, Santiago, uh, the Chile, Delhi in Timor de Lest uh, and partner in India. And we're interested in all sorts of violence, from political violence, domestic violence, economic violence, gangs, a whole lot of, it was a, it was a, com it was a mixture of, uh, it was a cocktail. But what was interesting was that uh, domestic violence always showed up, whether we're looking for it or not. Um, so, so what, I, I'll just give a little bit of those highlights on domestic violence specifically. Uh, it was uh, the 10 researchers that, uh, that were leading from these different cities. Um, and um, 
uh, of course, uh, there, are, there are some hot issues and cold issues. Um, the starting point of this um, um, study was more um, um, investigating the conventional causes of violence. And we focused on four, and these were largely political exclusion, prevalence of poverty, uh, youth bulges, and um, inadequate uh, uh, consideration of gender-based insecurity. And what we're trying to find out was the extent to which these conventional causes of violence uh, could actually be authenticated or confirmed uh, through specific grounded research on the ground. Um, well, grounded research on the ground. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so that's what we're doing. In terms of conceptual um, entry points, we decided to pick uh, um, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, were very well known uh, uh, book on, on tipping points, and uh, we're trying to figure out whether uh, this lens of um, of tipping points could uh, could be useful in terms of advancing discourses uh, on violence. Then the next bit was um, was violence chains. In fact, this came from um, um, those in, in economics commodity chains, and and, and uh, we're theorizing that maybe different types of violence uh, enrich each other if there's such terminology. Um, uh, more or less the way value addition uh, happens in commodity, cha commodity chains to the extent that then the violence, you know, becomes, you know, epidemic if you can build up and eventually explodes in the, in the, um, you know, uh, broader, broader terrains. Uh, but this is not what I, what I want to talk about. I, I actually want to talk about the insights that we got on gender-based violence specifically from this study. Uh, since I only have 20 minutes, I'll not tell you the whole of my life in violence, <laughs> as it were. But it's a very long study, it was a four-year study, actually, and, and, and very thorough uh, and, and, and quite grounded. Um, five, five insights that I want to highlight, and, and um, it was clear to us that a lot of uh, violence studies and violence policies uh, on gender-based violence tends to focus on women in the public domain. Um, that was one, one key thing that came to us. And, um, and, and, and violence in private places tends to be invisible or invisibilized, uh, if that's the correct English term. I don't, I, I've tried to f check it in the dictionary. It doesn't exist. But it tends to be <laughs> invisibilized, to be made invisible uh, in, in, in the private domain. Uh, one of the things that came out uh, was quite interesting, uh, the little uh, study on male-male violence. Th this came out particularly in the case of Dili where there was so much violence amongst you know, male youths in the public domain that nobody was seeing. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty interesting, uh, because it was taken to be a norm since it was linked with the, the martial arts culture uh, in, uh, in Timor de l'Est. And the other issue that, uh, that, that came out quite clearly was that uh, there's always a tendency to isolate uh, gender-based violence and look at it as a, a, as a very, very specific type of violence. Of course it is. Uh, but what was interesting for us was the extent to which gender-based violence uh, was linked with other forms of violence. In fact, uh, I think later on my colleague Carolyn will be highlighting this. Uh, for example, just the quantity of gender-based violence that happens in political contexts, I mean, is, is mind-boggling. It's on that during that time, nobody looks for it. The, the assumption is that the violence is based, I mean, I mean it's just around uh, contestation of power amongst political parties. But uh, it's quite interesting the extent to which some of these things get engendered. And we saw this a lot in our Nairobi uh, study. Um, last point, uh, my fifth point there, is that um, uh, the male-female violence is way more complex than patriarchy. Uh, this, this came out quite clearly, that uh, the, 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 there's a whole lot of uh, stresses in the family, including aspirations, economic aspirations of middle class uh, families uh, that put a lot of stress and actually translate into direct violence within the family uh, that go way beyond um, um, the patriarchal uh, subdivisions of, of our society. And what was very interesting, even in the Santiago uh, Chile case, was the extent to which there was violence amongst the high income women. Uh, which largely is quite understudied. Um, I will talk then quite briefly to um, a few thematic insights that, that, that came out of this study. In fact, my overall uh, presentation is really just about the invisibilization of gender-based violence and how it could actually be made more visible. Um, it's one of the thematic insights related to structural and non-structural gender-based violence. Uh, and, and, 
and, and, and I'll highlight this. I mean, on the non-structural side, there's a lot of emphasis on criminal acts against women in the public domain, and, 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 and this generally is dealt with uh, through policing, uh, as it actually were. And a lot of uh, studies, uh, policies, research tend to focus on, uh, on, um, on these non-structural aspects of, um, of gender-based violence. And, and we found out that there's quite a lot of structural violence condoned by society, sometimes not even identified as such, embedded in culture. And this was very, very clear in Patna, in, in, in Santiago and in Dili. And it's largely ignored by most researchers and policymakers because it's assumed that that's just the way the society is. Um, but of course, I mean, if you go to the actual definition of violence, then you realize that uh, it's, I mean, there's, this is actually violence, whether the, the societal norms or not. Uh, and a lot of these, of course, are socially and culturally embedded. Uh, uh, hence, uh, uh, culture and, and, and culture tends to invisibilize the non I mean, I mean, the structural uh, type violent. And, 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 and what is interesting is that even when this, this type of violence becomes widespread, becomes epidemic, nobody still sees it uh, as compared to, say, political violence. It's only when you look at the figures that, you, that you're shocked that actually there's been so much, you know, um, uh, culturally sanctioned rape, for example, in particular, in particular, you know, instances. Um, but but it's only obvious when you look at it, as opposed to um, say political violence that plays itself, you know, on the street. Uh, and the point I'm trying to make here is that um, structural gendered violence is often not con conceptualized as such. Uh, research has not looked at this uh, uh, enough, and of course uh, there's, ha there's no policy or programmatic inter interventions we found on this type of violence. Um, the second bit um, relates to public and, and, and private gender-based violence. In other words, gender-based violence in the public space versus the private space. Uh, you can call it at home and on the street. Uh, and again, uh, we see that uh, gender-based violence uh, in literally all our case studies cities started drawing attention when it got into the public space. And, and nobody was willing to accept that there's so much gender-based violence happening at home. And, 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 and for us, um, this, was, uh, this was interesting because was, once we started uh, doing our grounded research, we found that th there was so much violence in private spaces but of more concern was that this violence was also privatized. So a lot of people owned the violence and did not even want to speak about it. And, 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 and you know, it's just what happened uh, in there. And, and of course, I mean, hardly, you, you find, you know, a, there's hardly any, any policy or any, any, any sort of um, societal actions around this. Uh, the violence in the public space is quite a bit of responses, and I just highlighted some of these uh, uh, issues about ar ar around working on quality of spaces, um, on places where women tend to get attacked, on policing of criminal acts. I mean, th these you found in all these other places. Um, you know, um, mapping of hotspots uh, where violence happens so that you can get response. I mean, so yes, I mean, the public bit is getting attention, but the private bit is not getting attention. And number two, more worrying is that the private bit is privatized. Uh, it's not just about the location, it's about the ownership of that, of, of, of that violence. So again, uh, that is uh, uh, violence in private space is another invisibility, if you can call it that. Um, the other one, which again, we had not sought out to, to, to specifically look for, uh, was uh, gender-based violence across economic classes. And we had a lot of debate, particularly uh, before uh, looking at this specifically in Santiago, Chile, where we were told there was no violence. In fact, we started looking at the Santiago, Chile case as a counter case, uh, because there was never meant to have been any violence there in the first instance. Uh, and, 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 and it was quite interesting that eventually we found out that Santiago had, among the case studies cities, had an ex extremely high level of, of violence and across economic classes. Again, we, we decided uh, with the economic classes as, as control because uh, was coming from a starting point that uh, violence tends to, gender-based violence tends to increase a lot with poverty. So the poorer you are, the, uh, the more you're likely to perpetrate uh, gender-based uh, violence. But, but of course, I mean, um, it was quite clear that uh, in, in our Santiago case that uh, this violence was across all the classes. And, and e the only thing that happened was that it, it manifested itself quite differently. 
and and the higher you went in the economic classes, the more the less visible it came. Uh, it became partly because um, of the aspirations of uh, the middle class and the higher income. Uh, they were never uh, uh, they never wanted to be perceived as being associated uh, with vagaries of um, of uh, you know. Uh, to use the Marxist term, lumpen proletariats, uh, who actually cannibalize each other, uh, you know, uh, in these low-income, you know, groups. But of course, uh, eventually, once um, the study got underway, it was quite shocking, uh, just um, um, the extent to which this was present. And actually, what was interesting again in our Santiago case, the extent to which drugs was a contributing factor, especially uh, for middle-income uh, youths, uh, as it were. Um, so uh, my last slide, I think I'm still within my times, um, uh, is really what I'm calling the visibility invisibility continuums uh, in the gender-based violence. I believe, and also based on the evidence we found from the ground, uh, that uh, without actually conceptualizing these and l under understanding these continuums and, uh, and, and crafting policy responses around the continuums, we will only be scratching the surface of gender-based violence. And of course, um, I've highlighted the continuums. Um, uh, the non-structural structural continuum is, is one such continuum. Uh, the focus currently is on, uh, I mean, on non-structural uh, gender-based gender violence, but we need to shift to push these continuums into the socially and culturally sanctioned uh, structural aspects um, of gender-based violence. Um, there is uh, uh, the, the public-private continuum. I think we need to chase violence from the streets and run with it all the way into people's homes and bedrooms, we don't know how, in research and in policy, uh, to be able to understand fully uh, 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 the gender-based violence. We need to not just focus on it when it's pale solver in the public domain. As researchers, we need to figure out tools that we can use to effectively uh, unveil and unmask uh, violence that happens in dark private places. Uh, the rich, the poor rich continuum. In fact, this, uh, when, when I was studying our study, uh, this was a counter finding, actually. When I was studying our study, um, one of the key um, uh, drivers of violence was poverty. So that was a given, it's only that we question it. We need to at least start uh, asking ourselves uh, the nature of gender-based violence that happens uh, in these other classes, uh, the high income and the middle income. In fact, when we found the middle income, we said, ah, even the high income, really. Yeah, because the assumption is that uh, people are very have, have power and have control over their lives uh, because of uh, uh, economic, uh, their economic status, and our research actually discounts that that there's quite a bit of uh, condoned and sanctioned violence, the middle income and, and, and the high income. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to me. Thank you. Uh, um, Ka would you like to go next? Uh, Caroline, I think, was the yes. second. <coughs> Thank you. Um, thank you very much, and I and thank you again to the Woodrow Wilson Center for inviting me here. Um, I'm an old friend, and I always enjoy um, the discussions that we have in this sort of in, in this in the spirit of the intellectual candy shop, mm -hmm. um, as much as people sort of gain from some of our experiences. I gain a lot from the responses that I get um, in conversations like this. I think my my um, presentation today is, is going to complement um, Alfred's quite nicely because what I, what I do is I really hone in on, uh, on an event, uh, on, on the 2007-2008 on the elections, election violence um, in, in Kenya, in, and, and particularly I look at what happened in Kibera during that time. So it's not to discount that violence happens outside of those major political conflicts. Um, but it's really to understand what happens and how does gender um, help us understand better 
what violence is and how violence manifests itself. So it provides a good sort of, uh, it, I drill down um, more than sort of speak broadly about, about, the cont about violence. And if there was a perfect slum, you know, Kibera would be it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure everybody in this room has heard of, has seen images, has, has talked about, has been to endless talks about Kibera. Um, and it fulfills this, everybody's fantasy about um, how impoverished and hopeless and violent urban spaces are, particularly in these third world c countries where, where urbanization just um, is completely unmanaged and where the state has <coughs> not um, been able to catch up with the numbers of people coming into the city. Um, and um, if we look at, uh, I was told this will work. I hope it works. <laughs> <laughs> if we look at Kibera, uh, just very quick, uh, it's 250 hectares, extremely uh, overcrowded with about 170,000 people there. Um, it has ho low human um, I um, in development outcomes, extremely high HIV rate, which is three times more than outside of um, than the rest of the country. Um, we also see it as, a, as this violent and fearful place. Um, but in addition to that, Kibera is also the most researched, the most photographed, and even the topic of, you know, uh, of a Hollywood film um, and the site of um, the Hollywood film, Con the Constant Gardener. So it's extremely, um, it's extremely sort of publicized and romanticized, etc. So it's, it's, some, it's, it's, it's this space that sort of captures everybody's imagination. Um, so my talk is really drawn out of a research uh, project that I've been undertaking over the last um, 18 months. And the research really hones into the moment of the post-election violence in 2007, 2008 um, in Kibera. But what I do is I, I investigate this, um, this event or, this, uh, or the violence using a gendered frame. Um, and I ask really three main questions. How are men and women differentially affected by violence? What roles do men and women play in fueling but also mitigating the violence? So, um, and, and really, how do the ways in which men and women are socialized in that context, how does that change the nature of violence? And those are the three questions that I set up um, to, to explore around this um, topic. And I, because we are more interested in the findings, I'll really do a very quick recap on, on, on the 2000 elections. So, you know, it was December 2007. Everybody thought that the Kenyan elections were a great success, and then boom. Um, um, Mwai Kibaki, who is a Kikuyu, was announced as winner. Um, and, and this created havoc because um, on the television screens, um, on the, um, people could see that the votes were not going to Mwai Kibaki and somehow, and somehow this, um, this glick, glip um, um, came, came onto the screen. So about 12, as a result of that, violence um, sort of erupted across the country um, and about 1,200 Kenyans um, lost their lives, 300,000 were displaced, um, and millions and millions of dollars of property were, were destroyed. And so that, that's really the background. And what happened in Kibera was um, militias began to form between the two presidential candidates, um, Rai Laodinga, who is Luo, and um, Mwai Kibaki, who was Kikuyu. And this militia began to create the conflict that, that, we, now, that we now know happened. And the violence in Kibera only ended after the um, signing of a peace agreement between the two leaders in February. So it was two months of violence and conflict in that area. Um, and we've seen the images splashed um, across our television screens and in international media. Um, now, I want to draw your attention to these images, but what I want you to look at is the ways in which men and women are depicted in them. Um, if we look at that <coughs> versus the women's picture, if we look at that gun-toting sort of machete-holding uh, young man versus the woman sort of running away from the violence. And, and men are often depicted as these violent, aggressive, macho, um, machete holding, uh, bludgeoning, aggressive, whatever, <laughs> violent people. 
Whereas women are depicted as these victims of violence, uh, and, 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 and most policy responses are around trying to save uh, women. Um, and I, I argue that, you know, the stereotypes of women as peace, the peace-loving feminine and, and the male as the macho aggressive violator um, can really prevent us from understanding conflict generally um, and developing appropriate long-term responses for it. And that's really the key argument that I want to try and make. And if we look broadly at how scholars have explained the violence in Kibera, we will see three broad narrative arcs. The first is that it was a state, it was state-centered or state-sanctioned violence. It was two big men in politics contesting over um, political power, and as a result, they used their constituencies to to um, enable that that contestation. The, st the, second fa the second argument th is made is that we, you know, it's, it's a context where there is structural inequality. Global economic, global and local economic um, uh, forces really have created a wealthy class, a minority wealthy class, and a majority uh, poor um, who are uh, completely unable to have any hope of survival. And as a result of which, um, violence occurs when, mo when, when the poor are mobilized and they begin to uh, try and take back some kind of space or fight for more equal, uh, equality. The third um, uh, argument has been made by scholars um, around this particular event is that, um, th you know, conflict, conflict is, is really a local issue. And, and the conflict in, in Kibera can be traced back for hundreds of years to the insecurity of tenure, nobody in, in Kibera has, has security of tenure, um, to tensions in ethnic, with, in ethnic relationships um, that, that continue, that are ongoing on an everyday basis, um, to historical social relationships between landlords who have the money and, 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 and the structures and, and, and tenants, um, and to really class conflict. So, so they try and become a bit nuanced around understanding the, re the context um, in which poor people or in which Kibera is and how that context actually fuels or instigates the, um, the, the, the crisis, the conflict. And, and my argument is not to say that these, um, these um, analyses are wrong. In fact, I think they are, they are all spot on in, in many ways. But what, what, what I'm arguing is that they remain gender blind. Um, uh, and gender cuts across all these things. It cuts across ethnic uh, divides. It cuts across uh, political um, affiliation. It cuts across um, class. And, and, as a, and they're una really unable to tell us how the unequal distribution of resources power, access to, uh, to government institutions at global, national, and local levels differentially affect men and women, um, and how these differences then result in particular modes of violence. For example, why did we see such an incredible rise in rape in Kibera during the conflict? Um, the structural um, or the, or the, the state-centered explanation can't really help us understand that. For example, why did we see forced circumcisions during the violence? Um, and really none of the explanations that we have right now can tell us or try and help us to understand why some, o some of that were, some of those were used as part of the weapons of, of the conflict. So I'm just going to really rush through three aspects of the findings, and, and it, uh, it has been a rich study um, over the last year and a half, but I hope that you know uh, some of this will be available once it's published, etc. But but this for, for the for the sake of time, uh, I'll just run through three um, three main points that we and and then you can look at the beautiful pictures <laughs> 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 that that um, I've taken. It'll it's really to give you a context of the place that I'm talking about. Um, um, yeah, so. When, when I started, um, I wanted to understand um, how uh, gender and violence, uh, you know, intersect in, in Kibera. And, and I would ask Kiberians what roles they expected men and women to play under normal times. You know, we had to talk about the normal times and the time of conflict, that time of conflict. 
And when we talked about the normal times, their responses were conservative, and were, their responses were just as w we would expect. Women are seen as nurturers, um, peace-loving, and men are seen as protectors and providers um, of the family. Um, in normal times, the notion of the aggressive male is criminalized. And they take on the persona of the hated idler. I mean, if you go to Kenya now, everyone is talking about those idlers, the people who hang around on street corners um, and who meet out violence and, and rob people and mug people at night. And, and, and this was really the, the, the notion of this kind of aggression under normal times is completely uh, unacceptable. During normal times, too, and this is quite interesting, um, ethnic divides are not seen as sources of conflict and division, but as practical and even amiable relationships in a community that is so close together, I mean, where people. Um, one of the women said to me, we cannot live without other tribes in Kibera. I mean, I am renting a house from Aluya. This is a one. Tr My electricity is provided by a man who comes from the coast, another, another ethnic group. I buy my water from a mkamba. My household goods are from a kiosk owned by a Kisi woman. It's, we, we have to live together. And when talking to business people, business people in Kibera do not want conflict, like business people anywhere else. Conflict is bad for business. So uh, under normal times, these are the relationships between, um, um, between genders and between people. During times of conflict, however, however those, those kinds of um, gendered uh, notions or identities c get completely scrambled. Um, expectations of men and women uh, um, are very different. Um, conflict really creates highly volatile and fluid spaces which allow us to problematize the unquestioning notion um, fixed notions of masculinities as protectors, as, as providers, and femininity as, as peace-loving um, and, and nurturing. Um, so it was interesting how in times of political conflict, the aggress aggressive violent male became decriminalized and in fact idealized. So um, when the stakes were high, when people were fighting, men had to be out there meeting out their violence on the other. Uh, s men who did not go out were, were sort of labeled as uh, cowards or shameful to their, to their tribes. One of the women told me, I told my man to stop sitting in the house like a coward and go out and fight like a man. I said to him, stop being a woman. And these are the expectations of masculinities during times of conflict, during times of war. Um, there was the sort of emergent discourse that a real man is, 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 is a fighter. The real man is aggressive. The real man is violent. <clears throat> and in listening to conversations am amongst women, it was really easy to see how relationships between men and women become key to fueling violence. So it's triggered by a political event. But what keeps it going um, is sometimes some of these relationships, which, which are really not visible in, in the way in which we analyze and understand um, um, conflict. When we look at gendered relationships in society and expectations of men and women, we begin to understand how men who might not ordinarily go to war can be pressured to doing so to save face in the community. And contrary to beliefs that women are these peace-loving people who nurture and all, all they want is sort of to keep, keep the peace, what I discovered in Kibera is actually almost quite the opposite. During times of conflict, women become part of that conflict. Um, there were spies, for example, in identifying enemy homes. There were cooks for gangs. Um, and what I remember... Yes, I saw that. <laughs> Thanks. I'm almost done. There were cooks for gangs. And what I remember most about asking women, they said, what do you remember? What do you remember about that time of conflict? And they would say, hunger. We were very hungry. And they were hungry because Kibera was closed up. Nobody could come in. Nobody could leave. There were no supplies. People had money. And how do you feed militia if you don't have food? Women became extremely important in, in, in doing that. Um, in looking for food and in cooking for the militia so that they could protect the territories. Um, 
they kept watch for enemy attacks at night. So a lot of people would take shifts in sleeping, women included, so that they could uh, warn a militia that an enemy was coming. Um, and they were killers. I remember one woman telling me how she saw a group of four women, two of whom she recognized, killing, butchering a young man with their machetes. So, so this whole idea of, of this sort of um, the, 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 the um, peaceful uh, feminine just, just ruptures under, under times of conflict. So what looking at gender really allows us to do is understand the conflict and its production is broader really than the battle lines, than the soldier, uh, than the gangs who are right out there. Um, and it incorporates uh, spaces beyond, beyond that, that front line. Women's everyday mundane activities like nurturing, cooking, buying food, and even sleep become part of the production line in the manufacture of violence. Um, and so that's an important part of understanding um, violence. And lastly, last point that I want to make, um, my research looks at how gender is a medium of asserting the dominance of certain ethnic cultural notions of masculinities. Um, and this helps us explain why violence took the forms that it did. Um, there were unprecedented rapes during that time and circumcisions, so-called circumcisions. Um, a lot of clinics went in, a lot of uh, people working in clinics all of a sudden had to deal with, um, uh, with men whose penises had been cut off. A lot of morgues had uh, men who had bled to death as a result of that. And, and rape counseling and, and rape, uh, you know, it, it, it just became, um, you know, this, this crazy <laughs> um, war. And, and the reason for this, um, we can understand this by, by looking at notions of uh, who a real man is in, within certain cultural contexts. In Kikuyu tradition, for example, an uncircumcised man is known as a kihe, which means a boy who has not yet become a man, you know? And, and as a result of which, Mungik, the Mungiki, who are the Kikuyu militia, would, would, would pick out um, uncircumcised men and circumcise them to make them men, to, to assert their masculine dominance over them. Um, the Lures who don't circumcise but also have, have other rituals of, of becoming, uh, uh, of becoming um, decided that the way in which they, they could revenge would be to rape, uh, which would be to use rape as a form of dominance. And one woman explained to me one of the traumas. She, she was coming into the, to the settlement and she didn't know that there was, the war had started and, and she was gang raped. And at the end of that, she was told, go back and tell them that we are real men. And, and, um, and those are the ways in which, and, and a lot of the ways in which we understand conflict don't tell us that the, some, of the, some of these um, notions of violence are embedded in our cultural values and in the way in which we raise men, uh, boys and girls. Um, so what, this is my last point, to address urban conflicts, I think we need to take cognizance of the complexities of human identities and relationships. Um, we may address the, a political crisis, you know, but, but, live, but leave simmering underneath these other tensions and sources of conflict. And I mean, conflict takes on its own direction. A political um, fight, struggle at a national level triggers all kinds of other things and, it, and, and, and the conflict runs away with itself. Becomes, um, and this is what we don't really understand. Um, and peace programs often see men as violent and women really as peaceful. But women are complicit in, in, in times of conflict, whether they're at the battlefields or not. And, and somehow some, we need to get to that population and we need to address that. Um, I, I, I wish I had all the answers for that, but um, it's, it's, a, it's something that's missing. We need to begin to design policy responses around that. Um, and then also, of course, educating the next generation around masculinities and femininities. Uh, um, how we do that, I, I don't know. But I am left with, um, with, a, with a quote from Millicent, who was my host in Kibera and also has become a friend. Um, 
And after the elections, because uh, obviously I, 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 I worked until after the, the elections that were just a couple of um, years ago, not even, um, and, and nothing happened in Kibera, right? So, so there was, it didn't blow up as it did in 2007, 2008. And I said to her, so do you think then we've resolved this issue? And she said to me, what we have now is suppressed peace. We have resolved nothing. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Alison? It's a hard job following two good talks like uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> because um, my work is, I think, <coughs> I hope complementary, kind of comes at things from a different, uh, a different angle, um, but also because mine is a work in progress, and um, I uh, gratefully build upon, I'm grateful, first of all, to the Wilson Center and to the program for putting together this amazing event. Um, I'm a, I'm a fellow here. I've been at the Wilson Center since September, and um, I learn something important every day that I am here. Um, and I've just, in the past 40 minutes, learned a, a bunch of important things. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to do is contribute to this conversation, to the understanding, and to addressing gender-based violence, violence against women, um, as our um, uh, coordinator pointed out, you know, I have written quite a bit on human rights issues over 20 years um, because I keep trying to understand and I keep trying to get it right. And I have looked at a number of different issues. Um, okay, and I'm also just technological. There we go. Okay, I've looked at a number of different issues, um, but you know, I started out looking at sort of government and opposition, very conventional political science sort of human rights issues, and I've been turning more and more to precisely the kinds of things that um, Alfred pointed out, this continuum of public and private violence. I started to look I, it was the, looking at the issue of human trafficking that sort of shifted my own lens because I'm a political scientist. That's what I'm trained to do. I'm trained to look at laws, policies, institutions, um, sociological drivers of violence. Um, and you'll see a bit more of that in this presentation. Um, we're going back to the very macro level. That's what I'm looking for. Um, but um, I really began to see co continuities between global, national, and local patterns of violence, between private and public domain drivers of violence, and since I've been here at the Wilson Center, between different forms of violence against women um, and different kinds of uh, gender regimes is one term that's used, rape regimes is another term that's used. So. Um, this isn't on my slide, but I will just align myself with some of Albert's obser Alfred's observations and, and sort of relates to Carolyn. When I look at India, um, that's one of the places I've spent some time. I was on a Fulbright there in 2011. Um, you know, and people sort of struggle about, well, what are the statistics on rape in India? And these shocking, terrible cases in Delhi and then Kolkata and then Mumbai, if you keep following the news, uh, well, if you look on paper, you know, the rate of rape is actually not that high. Oh, well, yes, but it's tens of thousands of cases, but you know, India is such a big country. But if you look at the whole complex of, for example, uh, domestic sexual abuse, so if you go from non-partner violence and you just pluck a statistic out of the best measure we have on domestic violence, gender-based violence against women, 14.8% of women report, so this is a minimum, report that they've been violently sexually abused in their homes. If you do the math, that's about 60 million women, minimum, if that survey is representative. So we are talking about a massive problem, in, and in India, again, let's just stick to that country where I know the pattern pretty well, there's street violence, there's domestic violence, there's ethnic violence. 
In fact, there has just been a, um, a trial of, um, on some, some ethnically directed violence in Gujarat. In 2002, the trial just completed, um, and which there was a very similar mobilized ethnic gangs, rioting, and rape was used as a tool of conflict. So that's not exactly rape as a weapon of war. It's, I would call it rape as a weapon of peace. Um, but, you know, again, you have these complexes, these social complexes where there's violence in the home, violence among communities, and as a tool of social stratification and domination. Um, and then you have street crime. But one of the things that I've been uh, observing since I've been trying to just map the global patterns of violence against women is that sexual violence plays a special role as a form of violence and as a form of terror and, and torture. Um, and that there is something that's not being widely realized at a global level that has something to do with urbanization and social inequality. That at a local level, in case studies, people are reporting this, but at a global level, we're tending to focus on uh, rape as a weapon of war, and we're tending to focus on street crime as a, as a criminological issue. So what I'm trying to do is bring a kind of sociological human rights perspective and try to see if there are some global commonalities that we can trace, all right? So in 2010, just this weekend, we have a new study that shows that worldwide we can estimate 7.2% of women reported non-partner sexual violence. So that is public assault. Uh, do the math there, it's about 216 million women affected. In South Africa, we have about 60,000 rapes reported per year. Again, we know that it's underreported. We know that that's a minimum. In Brazil, uh, we have about, uh, according to the Brazilian Ministry of Justice figures, we have about 150% increase in reported sexual violence in the past five years. Um, and there's been pretty good reporting and efforts at reporting for 10 or 15 years. So probably the last five years, some of that is going to be new reporting, but some of that is going to be a genuine phenomenological increase, okay? Um, so uh, there are uh, some projects where people are really trying to map prevalence better. Because, uh, again, we know there's underreporting. We know there are it's extreme variance in um, country practices on this issue. We have this one new uh, worldwide report that was, uh, I believe, was Lancet this past week. Anyway, this is from the Woman Stats Project. Some of you know or know of Valerie Hudson and her team that has been doing very good work. So what they've done, they have a number of different indicators of violence against women, different forms of violence against women. And they have one exercise in which they try to collect data on reports of uh, rape and public non-partner sexual assault. And they weight it and adjust it for different mechanisms of the legal system and of reporting and how possible it is to report and how the data is being collected and of social taboo and stigma. And what they come up with, from my knowledge of about a dozen of the cases, looks pretty um, accurate. So this is a 1 to 10 scale, darker is worse. Uh, and you see that um, certainly conflict zones of Africa are some of the worst and of parts of the Middle East. But you also have a number of countries like Mexico, India. Um, South Africa is actually high moderate on this scale um, that are not only not conflict zones, but they're not extreme poverty and they're not extreme patriarchy either. And that intrigued and disturbed me as a social scientist. So I'm trying to look at what some other kinds of drivers could be, OK? Um, the other reason that I'm trying to do this as a broad sociological project that's very comparative is that um, I think 
culture plays an important role, but um, I think that there are some broad based features of patriarchy that change and morph over time. And um, I think that, for example, if we compare, let's say, India, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, which are some of the countries I'm doing in-depth work on, um, these are countries that have very different cultural roots. And, um, and they're all democracies, they're all sort of thin democracies in which um, governance is troubled, but they're not war zones, um, and they're not the poorest or the most patriarchal. Um, the, there are also countries in which not only is uh, sexual violence endemic um, and possibly rising, but in which the harms of sexual violence are rising. In other words, there, uh, Mexico has done a femicide study in which they show an increasing use of weapons in sexual assault. Uh, there are increasing reports within, uh, certainly within South Africa and in India, of gang rape, uh, of assaults on children, all right? So again, this is something that we need to understand better. Um, so what do we notice about all of these countries? They are all rapidly developing. There's a dynamic process here. Um, and one of the things that I think both um, Heather and Carolyn have talked about is that um, it's not just the static features. It's not just, for example, poverty. It's change. It's economic change. It's inequality. So the, I want to look more at the dynamic features. So urbanization, it's not just how urban a country is. It's whether there is a process of urbanization. That social change um, tends to be a driver and a tipping point for conflict and violence of all kinds, and let's look at what is happening on this gender-based violence. Um, so there are also places with youthful populations, high levels of social inequality, and shifting gender roles, and I'll talk in a minute about why that kind of change, I think, actually fuels violence. All right, so here's my big, this is all I have right now, but I think it's something. Um, I've been collecting data on some factors that I think are maybe associated with this, and I am planning uh, pretty soon to try and do a worldwide study that looks at these factors and some others. Now, what we would expect to see here, I use the, the weighted rape index from the Hudson Woman Stats um, as my outcome, just because we have to pick one outcome, and I'm going to try different ones, and uh, by the way, one of the reasons I'm here is that I, uh, I'm imagining this is a very uh, interested and skilled audience, and some of you may know of data sources. Please, come on down. Um, so anyway, um, so we look at some, some hot spots um, where you've got a pretty high number there in most cases. Um, and um, then what we should expect to see is that some combination, not any single one, but some combination of these factors, high levels of um, urbanization, social inequality, uh, male youth unemployment is my best idea of a, of a proxy uh, for uh, social stress, um, economically based social stress, and uh, gender inequality, uh, and corruption as a marker for governance problems, for poor policing and so forth. Um, and uh, indeed, um, if you look across these levels, you'll see things like that, you know, India is the least urbanized, right? But look at the growth level, look at the urbanization level, 2.4% a year. That's, that's pretty major. I'm not a demographer, but that looks kind of, kind of uh, problematic, potentially. <laughs> uh, uh, the... Um, the, uh, the Gini index is not terrific, but it's not as bad as some of the others, although this is 2010. Uh, but look at the gender inequality index, you know, that's, that's pretty bad. These, this is the rank out of all countries, out of all 200-ish countries in the world. So that's, India's the worst on that, all right? So for, for India, you've got th those kinds of drivers. Um, oh, and by the way, corruption is, is the lower, the the grade the um, the worst corruption is so India is really bad on corruption really bad on gender inequality 
um, you know, moderately unequal, lots of rapid urbanization and rapid growth. So um, then if we look at South Africa, what is the, the stat that really pops out at you um, is that male youth unemployment figure, 48%. That, to me, is a Hobbesian figure, you know. I, I don't think that, uh, I think that all sorts of social norms would break down at 48%. That, that's just, uh, that, it, that is like a war zone, right? Um, and um, then if you look at, um, at Mexico, the inequality is uh, particularly stunning. Um, the corruption is pretty bad. Uh, if you look at, um, what else was I going to point out here? Um, at, uh, sorry, Indonesia? Yeah, Indonesia, which pops up on the, I, I spotted that because of the, uh, the rape scale. Uh, and then I started looking at uh, the, the growth is, you know, pretty rapid. The um, urbanization is is pretty pretty rapid um and the male youth unemployment is pretty high again i i suspect there's a tipping point at around let's say 20 percent for the male youth unemployment and i suspect in some in corruption also we're going to find some tipping points and you know some uh relationships there so i'm going to be looking for that and again i invite your comments now let me talk a little bit about why it is that i'm looking at these factors some of this is the conventional wisdom and some of it um maybe tries to push a little beyond that. So obviously the youth unemployment, um, the displaced young men, physically displaced, economically displaced, uh, we know about crime bulges and all of that. Um, uh, but then we also have rapid urbanization, rapid growth that leads to vulnerable young women because a lot of young women are involved in local and rural urban and even international labor migration in a, in a new way. And I would actually would like to get a measure of that. Um, I started noticing this around the femicides around the, uh, the US-Mexico border, where it's precisely the young female migrants that are being targeted and assaulted and, and killed. And, and, um, and it appears in a lot of the, uh, the Indian urban rape cases, a lot of these young women are recent migrants or young women who came to the city to, to work or for education. Um, so that creates a vulnerable population. Um, crowding and resource competition, obviously, an urban governance crisis, most visible in terms of gender-based violence in transport, in problems with transportation, and it's via transportation that a lot of the attacks are taking place. Um, there's obviously a rule of law gap with policing and something that Albert and I were talking about in terms of uh, the privatization is that not only are police not enforcing laws, not only are police sometimes negligent, sometimes police are perpetrators. Um, and we really have to deal with that. Oops, five minutes, okay. Um, and um, now, you know, gender, I wanna stress the sociology, but we do need to look at that gender inequality index. What do patriarchal attitudes do at a, at a macro level? They label, they brand women as disposable people. Uh, and acceptable targets. And as I think Carolyn is so ably pointing out, men and women share this socialization. Um, and there are women who reinforce this socialization as well. So if we want to look at culture and education, um, we want to very specifically look for those sorts of attitudes and interventions uh, while we're trying to make the world a better place in every other way, this, uh, again, I want to identify some of the triggers and drivers so that we can, our interventions can be more targeted and more effective. Uh, things that I still need, feel like I need to know more about are the role of gangs, urban gangs, uh, which seem to be playing a, uh, a predominant role. And we know, for example, that sexual violence is a recruiting mechanism for urban gangs across a number of these countries, very different cultural backgrounds and political situations. Gangs are very often turning to 
sexual violence as a recruiting mechanism and as a stratification mechanism within male dominance hierarchies within the gangs and then when in prisons and then they come out of prison. So there's something about that dynamic that I think I want to understand better and maybe some one of you does. Uh, conflict triggers, um, tipping points. Uh, I've talked a little about the special challenges of reporting and evidence for violence against women, for measuring what's happening, is it getting worse? Um, why is the violence more gender-based in some places and not others? There's another big study, this World Health Organization Asia study, that um, shows, you know, people are talking about it because it shows shocking rates of perpetration and men admitting being perpetrators. But if you look at the, at the prevalence, for example, uh, there is a huge amount of sexual violence in Timur. Um, and um, there's actually not very much in rural Bangladesh. And they, they tested a few times. They were so surprised that they tested victim reports, perpetrator reports, and no, indeed, you know, there's lots of violence. There's domestic violence. People are being beaten, but there's not that much. So why does gender-based violence take different forms in different places? Okay. Uh, well, current interventions, uh, civic mobilization, legal reform, policing, urban policy, technology and communications, cultural change, um, but what we need, I think, is to assess what we're finding about drivers and where the interventions are mm -hmm. and really do a better job, uh, as again, Alfred was beginning to discuss about, you know, which interventions are going to get at which of these factors. Uh, and then, so finally, what does the urban conflict lens add to our understanding of gender-based violence and particularly sexual assault as a rising issue in a class of countries that I believe has been somewhat overlooked or understudied in sociological terms. That we focus on male at-risk youth employment, uh, that we target young urban migrant females, not generic female empowerment. Having someone like me elected to parliament isn't necessarily going to do a lot for the young woman getting on a bus to go to her job in Delhi. Uh, that we look more seriously at gendered policing, at urban housing and transportation issues, as again, I feel very complimentary here. Um, and that cultural change must address inequality, not just gender attitudes and conflict resolution, that we need to be more targeted about some of how we address these issues um, and really get inside some of these processes of social stratification and dominance, um, which is very deep tissue work. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, those were just three excellent uh, presentations that uh, did what I actually expect from a good, uh, a good seminar, is that it intellectually surprised me of, uh, uh, about some of those conclusions. So what we will do, I think, is uh, investigate some of those surprises. And I'll, um, I, I just would like uh, to, 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 to uh, ask one, one question about those surprises and let, let, uh, let you talk a little bit more about them, in fact. Um, First, uh, I was most surprised, actually, by uh, in Alfred's talk um, about this idea of culturally sanctioned violence. Not overly surprised. I mean, you brought it out. Uh, it's something that we see. Uh, and, and I know that uh, maybe Shelley can uh, to address some of this, is that in the um, DHS presentation uh, uh, surveys, uh, very often, uh, I mean, there's a, there is a, a module on, on on sexual violence. And one of the surprising results of that is that uh, when asked a follow-up question about where was violence perpetrated upon you, uh, there's another question that's, that is something like, um, is that okay? Do, would you, do, you, uh, do you go along with that? Would, it, would, did, should your husband, should your spouse uh, perpetrate this violence on you? And it varies a great deal, but there is a significant number of women, and particularly in, um, in India, that, uh, that suggest that that was, uh, that they deserved it in some way. I, that's not the right wording, but uh, it's there, and it's quite, uh, I think it was quite shocking when, when uh, AID 
when we got those results back. Um, so, uh, Alfred, uh, could you talk a little bit more about, um, about this idea of culturally sanctioned violence and define it a little bit for us and maybe give us an example? Yes, thanks. Uh, my question here. Yeah, thanks. I think um, um, what, what what I'm generally referring to here is um, is culture as uh, you know those norms uh, in society, and not necessarily you know norms, practices, and so on in any society, as opposed to say uh, traditional cultures per se. And um, and we found um, amazing evidence of uh, complicity. Um, when it came to issues of violence and, and, and even in perpetration of the same based on these, uh, on these practices. I'll, I'll, I'll give very, very uh, uh, you know, specific examples. Um, in, in, in our study in, in Patna, India, for example, um, men were, were known to harass women who were taking baths uh, in, the, in, in standpipes that had been provided uh, for them uh, in places that were, not, that were considered insecure. And, um, and what happened was that um, these were then shifted to the police stations uh, so that the women could actually, um, you know, bathe uh, in, in, in safety. But what is interesting is that the police then continued uh, perpetrating the violence. The violence did not come down uh, because uh, this was something that was expected, considered normal uh, in, um, in, um, in Patna, India. And of course, uh, speaking again to what uh, Caroline was highlighting, um, in, in the Kenyan case, it's quite okay especially during uh, political contestation uh, for, uh, for uh, gender-based violence directed at opposing communities, particularly the notorious one between, uh, between, between the Luas and the Kikuyus. But uh, w again, what is, w what is quite interesting in the Kenyan case is, um, and, and we're discussing that with, uh, with Alison a bit earlier, is uh, police themselves perpetrating violence because, not necessarily because um, they're targeting uh, you know, the vulnerable people who, who've come to report violence to them, but actually because that is what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, even in their own camps. There's a lot of in, internal violence against women, which is acceptable uh, in the police, police camps, because that's the way, uh, you know, uh, life is organized and socially, you know, accepted. So they do not understand why somebody else should be coming to complain <laughs> about a non-problem uh, put, um, put uh, you know, differently. And um, in Santiago, Chile, what was interesting again, uh, and, and this is uh, on a lighter note, is the macho culture <laughs> uh, that a lot of, a lot of uh, um, uh, children from middle income families that were involved uh, with drugs and gangs and so on, it was actually expected that they would be violent. Expected, not just, uh, not, not the, the just violent. It was, uh, it was, it was macho, it was, uh, it was considered to be, you know, you are considered to be a more serious young male. Um, you know, if you're involved in these uh, 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 gang fights, but of course, several times also involved in uh, in literally abusing women. Yes, yeah, so, so so we have a lot of this culturally sanctioned and culturally embedded uh, violence. And of course, uh, in, in in my own discussion, um, I was bringing in the next uh, issue that actually culture also then makes this type of violence invisible, because it's not considered violence. It's considered that this is just the way the society is. Yes, so uh, Richard, I think I would like to leave it there. For okay, now. thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Alfred. So I'd shift to Carolyn and uh, let her um, maybe address a little bit more in depth um, <laughs> some of the things that she talked about, uh, about the gendered relationships uh, that are behind, deeply behind violence. I, actually, I, uh, coming from a nasty neighborhood myself, <laughs> that uh, I don't find you know, I don't find, I find that very plausible, what you're saying. It's not maybe shocks people that uh, women are involved in sort of, in the process, this long process that uh, leads ultimately to the explosion of violence. Um, but I thought it was fantastic. I've read some of the accounts that you, uh, you documented. Uh, but one thing that uh, I found was very, very interesting that uh, about, uh, and it reflects on democracy, about how difficult democracy can be and elections can be was that, as you noted, um, that people were, were uh, found strength and actually or found, or found it necessary to communicate across ethnic boundaries uh, in day-to-day -day life, but it was elections, at least this election, that drove them apart. And um, 
I wonder, what does that say to you about uh, the conditions that have to be in place for s very high levels of democracy? Does that, because you, you've been around quite a bit, you've traveled, um, and when you look at uh, the explosiveness of a community, of a multi-ethnic community forced into, pushed into this, uh, these small, dense urban spaces, what does that say about um, what we need to remember when people, particularly in this town, think that democracy is always uh, everybody's cure for everything? Um, I think that's a very interesting question because in many ways what happened in Kibera was a, str was a struggle for as a, res as a result of a democratic process. Mm -hmm. And people were just sort of um, venting out their ideas of, of, of who should have or who shouldn't have um, um, gotten, gotten the presidential seat. Um, but I, th I think, I think there's, there's a few, there's a f I mean, my easy, my, the easy answer, which is not necessarily trite, is that, um, is that democracy in societies like ours, which really have only had 50 years of being republics, um, it takes a long time. Look at how long it took in America. Look mm -hmm. at how long it took in Europe. And we're expecting that in, you know, 15 odd years or 10 odd years, you know, to like quickly shape up, let's, let's do it. Why I, you know. And, and in many ways, this is part of the process of the struggle of democracy. This is part of us, our societies kind of finding ourselves in this system um, and buying into the system, which I think um, is one of the problems is that, um, you know, so we're told now we have to, every five years, we've got to go and uh, to the ballot box and, and you know, there are you know, these institutions that we must, we, we need to buy into, that we need to have a stake in, institutions that have never been there for us. And all of a sudden, these are the places, the governments are the ones that we now need to, to, um, to buy into to help us run our lives. And I think that's, that's a bit of an ask. Um, and in many ways, the identities that remain pertinent because they have been there for a long time are, are our ethnic identities. Um, and then now are our class identities. Um, and, and political identities are shifting. And you know we are seeing a bit of um, some improvement, some consolidation at some level. But this is part of a process. And I think um, you know, just, just as other places in the world took um, as long as they needed to, 200 years, you know, uh, 50 odd years, uh, you know, we are trying, trying to sort of build our institutions in ways that communities and individuals can actually buy into them and have a stake in their, um, in, in their establishment and in their long longevity. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, Alison. Uh, yes. Yep, you're next. <laughs> so. Uh, I picked out um, what you had to say about female migrants as being, uh, again, not, not overly, you know, maybe intellectually surprising, but we've all seen these things. As you pointed out in the newspapers in India, you see who's being targeted, and that very often they're outside the community. This seems to go back to some of the things that people said about the, sort of in the smallest beautiful craze in the 1970s, um, that uh, we've left that the 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 the, si uh, the the village uh, and the small town where people knew everybody, and then there were all of a sudden these people coming in. They didn't know the ropes. They didn't know where to be at certain times. They didn't know who to call on. Um, what what do you think? What are the qualities of a migrant? Do you think that leaves them so vulnerable, particularly women migrants? I mean, are there, you know, are there anything, uh, anything in your data or anything in your observations that seem to uh, uh, well, I think that um, it's both the quality of the migrants themselves and it's also the quality of the society, the kind of uh, urbanization, the uncontrolled urbanization where there's a governance gap, there's a services gap, transportation is not accessible or reliable, policing is not provided, 
uh, you know, there's no lighting in the streets. Um, in, uh, in some settings, women are walking to water, walking to fuel, uh, you know, needing to reach outside the household, which is sometimes relatively more protected um, into public space and, and are very vulnerable just in that process. And so, I mean, in not just uh, very less developed areas, but also in, in refugee camps and in conflict situations now, we're looking at um, cook stoves and water and um, lighting and the way houses are built. And that's why I had that little tag note on the last slide that I didn't get to because I was rushing. Um, that we're just beginning to appreciate the sort of spatial vulnerabilities of uh, women in conflict situations, but that urban shanty towns in some ways are like refugee camps. Um, and in some cases, they are literally refugee camps because there are large internally displaced populations as a result of some sort of internal political conflict. Um, so um, there's so there's there's that factor of uh, female migrants, but then there's there's another factor um, in terms of um, uh, culturally sanctioned violence against women and against um, single women and young women and unattached women. Um, that um, so there's a connection between these two factors. One of the things I, I'd like to point out is that um, in, um, in uh, particularly these, the, the high profile Indian rape cases, um, many times the young women were actually accompanied by a male when they were attacked. Hmm. And there have been actually also, in the past year or so, there have been about six or eight really high profile cases um, and uh, one in Kolkata, a 14-year-old girl who was uh, set on fire after right. she was raped. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been a couple actually against, uh, against foreign tourists, uh, which of course got immediate legal attention. Uh, and, uh, but in, in, uh, in that case, it was, it was a couple. So this isn't sort of traditional patriarchal, you know, disciplining of women out on their own. Uh, they are, they're beating the man and, um, you know, targeting the woman. I mean, it's a different kind of violence and there's a different kind of vulnerability there. Um, and, um, yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's spatial vulnerability, there's social vulnerability. Um, and I think there's also a kind of construction of a new social, socioeconomic trauma that activates this conflict mentality of male aggression. So that the young men, the at-risk youth who are often unemployed and often in gangs, um, are being activated to be, to, to need to be aggressive um, and to need to be aggressive uh, within their own homes and relationships because, by the way, in South Africa, with those huge, huge numbers, um, a lot of the violence is uh, acquaintance or uh, partner, short-term partner related, not household we don't count it as domestic violence because it's not long-term partners or people who are living together or married, but it's boyfriends and um, it's and in very transient relationships in um, very socially splintered um, shantytown settings. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you, uh, I've seen where women's groups in South Africa are pressing the police to enforce the law. And they say, you know, we can't keep track of this because, you know, this isn't like, this isn't a real crime, it's not a real stranger rape, because she knew him. She knew him and then her very short-term boyfriend decided to uh, break up with her or decided to punish her for something and so he got his gang to rape her. Yeah. This is a genre of crime that's coming up. And so, 
uh, this is why I think really looking into some of these, um, the social trauma and um, the way in which that's translating into new forms of violence and new forms of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. uh, now we'd like to open it up to uh, the people in the audience for their questions. Did, does someone already have the microphone? And are we, uh, okay, well, I, when, you, uh, when you do get the microphone, please, uh, tell us your your name and affiliation, and please ask a question. And please ask one question, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, uh, my name is Kwasi uh, Bosompem. Uh, I'm a land use planner uh, based here. Uh, thank you very much for this, what you're putting up. And uh, I just want to make a quick question, but uh, before the question, you realize, we all realize the urbanization process going on uh, around the world, especially in developing countries, Africa in particular, where the process and the rate is so high, but the urban poor, the governance is what is creating these problems. In my work all over uh, from Nigeria to South Africa, what we notice in Lagos, Nigeria, almost now has about 15 to 16 million people. What we see in Kibela, in fact, uh, most research work has not been done in Lagos because people are scared. <laughs> mm. Yes. In Lagos, what we notice when I'm living in the streets, there's much more economic and poverty violence. Men fighting men over bread, over a dime, over whatever. In South Africa, I listen from what you're saying, uh, what we did was we put a locational base to violence around the shebeens. The Shibins, those who know those South Africa, uh, are the illegal liquor homes. The illegal liquor homes are all over in the townships, and they run 24-7. Most violence takes place around a perimeter of the Shibins. My question is, in a, a state whereby we are in the process of a, a, a rising tide in violence, Governance is such law, no laws, and others. How do you put a, a stop or check and balances on some of these things? To us, it was actually much more an issue with uh, levels and patterns of distribution of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. Because if you take one shanty town, mm -hmm. you can count the uh, shebeens about 20 within a certain square kilometer. And the violence on men, on women, is continuum every day and then. To the extent that when I lived in South Africa, uh, you have a, a, an argument with your girlfriend or something like that, a South African friend will ask you a quasi beat her up. Which to me, coming from Ghana, it was very strange. But that is a cultural, uh, uh, that, uh, how do we find a way to uphold governance in a way to put an end to some of these things? Would anybody like to uh, address that? Or? Okay, well, why don't we, what we'll do, I know this is a, yeah, we'll take a few questions. I think that was, uh, yeah, we'll take a few, uh, second question here. Wait for the uh, microphone to, to come your way, please. Hi, uh, my name is Christy Srashta, and um, I'm an anthropologist by training. So, I mean, um, uh, this question is maybe more directed to, um, Dr. Alfred and Allison, you, um, both of you guys mentioned that violence is culturally sanctioned. Um, and I mean, as an anthropologist trained, I mean, it's to use culture in that broadly. And well, I guess I'll just get right to the question. One thing is um, when you say violence is culturally sanctioned, I'm understanding that it's something more static, that certain cultures actually continue to have violence embedded in it that it's static, but at the same time, when you say due to cultural changes in times of urbanization, violence is occurring. So it seems a bit contradictory when you say there's a cultural change happening in time due to um, like urbanization, and at the same time, it's culturally embedded, like it's something static. So that's... Okay. Well, can we have one more question then? There was a person over here that, right here, th this lady, yeah, right here. Yeah, I'll get you. 
Thank you. My name is Cornelia Weiss. I'm a member of the military, but I'm here in my personal capacity. Um, one observation and then one question. Um, I just I want to make sure that my hearing was correct, uh, where there is a discussion that Timor had more violence than Indonesia. I would submit to you it's because uh, you go to Dili, and probably every 20th house has a, an NGO there. And during my short time there, you know, it seemed like every day I was meeting a scholar who was studying this. So I think if it gets studied, then it gets um, um, uh, visibilized. And, uh, and other places it doesn't get studied, and so it, it, you know, we assume that it doesn't happen. Um, we, you all talked about uh, the need to have uh, male youth be employed. Um, from, from my perspective, I see a lot of what happens there is they get employed in security, um, the military, the police, and um, from my perspective, um, that gives them an additional weapon, that gives them a gun. And as um, I've, I've uh, I recently read a, a study on um, terrorism, and um, um, when, when a quote in there said, oh, it's great now that I'm in this because I have a gun, and because of that, I have been, it has enhanced my ability to seduce. Um, so um, with regard to, to the uh, male youth employment, um, I'd, I'd like to hear alternatives. Thank you. Okay, why don't we handle those three right at the beginning. Okay. Uh, I could start because uh, on the last point, first of all, um, I may have misspoken or you may have misheard. I don't, I didn't intend to say that there was more violence in Timor than Indonesia. It was Bangladesh. That was the comparison case. Um, and the po my point was not that there was uh, perhaps less gender-based violence overall, but that there was less sexual assault. Um, which, um, you know, there may be, uh, well, actually I've just recently seen a very high figure on domestic violence, uh, not distinguished but not noticeably sexual violence, but domestic violence uh, in Bangladesh is very high. There was a recent estimate of 85 percent uh, of households. Um, and. Um, uh, but non-partner public sexual assault, rape in Bangladesh in the World Health Organization study doesn't seem to be that high, whereas public sexual assault in Timor seems to be very high. So um, this would fit in with the post-conflict scenario. We tend to see worldwide a carryover, a lag after conflicts that levels of both public sexual assault and domestic violence remain high, higher than prior to the conflict for a number of years. I've seen that in um, Liberia, in Colombia. I've seen specific studies on that. So d does that clarify a little bit of that, that question? So I wasn't saying Timur versus Indonesia. I was saying Timur versus Bangladesh, and I wasn't saying more violence in Timor, I was saying more of a particular kind of violence that um, is probably associated with a, an armed conflict in that area. Now, as far as um, uh, uh, cultural, yeah, I'll, I'll move on and, and we can talk more. I think you'll have something to say about male youth employment. I t taken, your point well taken about security sector employment not necessarily being the kind that we want to promote. Um, um, but in terms of um, what we mean by culture or what I mean by culture, I, I won't speak for Alfred, but I suspect that he means something similar to what I mean having read his studies. Uh, and that is that uh, what we mean is a, a, a historic and internalized but evolving set of norms, all right? So we're not saying, and one of the reasons I'm doing things like comparing India and South Africa uh, and Egypt and Brazil is because they have very different cultures in that most pedestrian sense of religion and, um, you know, written documents on gender roles and things like that, that's not, certainly I would not claim that that in any automatic way translates into specific forms of behavior. Uh, but what I would say is that th we all have norms and there's been some work I think on norm theory and norm change. 
Um, it's a kind of internalized set of social rules for how to behave when and where it's acceptable to use violence, and in this case, gendered violence. Um, and that when there are external stressors, whether it's armed conflict or rapid urbanization and or, uh, and or socioeconomic stress and inequality, who you target and in what way and how you act out whatever aggression you're feeling is filtered by culture, but that that changes. And one of the things um, somebody was bringing up uh, in terms of culturally, oh, actually it was you, about culturally sanctioned violence, I wanted to jump in uh, and say that um, it's a serious problem everywhere, but there is some evidence of change. And that um, if, if you look at attitudinal material um, in youth cohorts, it's changing. Uh, education is a huge factor among men in attitudes toward violence. Um, and so, you know, that it's not static mm -hmm. also. That's the good news. In terms of governance, um, <laughs> I mean, that is the huge question. Uh, that is what we're all working on. And um, I don't have a particular solution for the Shabins. I'm not surprised, unfortunately. Um, but I think what it points to is that uh, we certainly need to look beyond the typical human rights policy pattern. The typical human rights policy pattern is that you reveal an abuse, you maybe generate some mobilization, international mobilizations, local protest, and then you pass a law, right? And, uh, or, uh, and you try to get that law enforced. Uh, and clearly there are about six broken links in that process here for these kinds of issues. Uh, so what that means is that we really need to look to building up governance and capacity at a community level. Um, and uh, we need to think about rebuilding governance capacity and corruption and you know the anti-corruption movements that are bubbling up all over the world now need to be taken very seriously as part of this equation. Yes, I'll, I'll pick uh, on, on, on that last point. And uh, yes, Kwasi speaks very close to, to my heart. I'm trained as, a, as an architect and urbanist, so <laughs> I look at space. Um, the one thing that uh, inner work and beyond the work uh, was basically the link between space and violence. And, 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 and uh, this is one thing that uh, um, has come through even beyond the study. Um, I'm, I'm an author of the State of African Cities report from 2009 every year. And one of the, uh, the, the issues we've been tracking uh, has been um, inequality and poverty. In we, we've, sta we've started shifting to, to small towns that are growing rapidly, that have no systems, that are not planned, that are basically big shanties with no governance systems, no policies in place, um, and so on. And and. The statistic we look at there is not violent statistic per se, but we look at crime. And there's a very clear correlation uh, between these fast growing uh, small towns with absolutely no governance structures and systems and, uh, and the overall uh, incidence of, of violence. So definitely that is, um, uh, I, I would agree with you actually, that there, that there is a governance problem, there's a governance issue. Um, uh, as part of our study, yes, we, we, we did make a whole raft of recommendations, but. Um, uh, what we are still struggling with is um, is uh, specifically how do you deal with um, uh, policies or programs that can target you know macro micro level violence as compared to higher up um, you know sort of uh, national type policies that uh, that would normally look very 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 well on paper but not protect you know you in your house or, or you know or a woman um, in specific places so so yes there is uh, the, the that is one area that is, is still pretty great. But one of uh, 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 our own insights was to start identifying institutions at micro level that one could actually work with. And these are both formal and informal institutions. Uh, you are looking at the church, you're looking at community leaders and stuff like that, and giving them tools that they could actually use. I mean, a, a good case that we did in Nairobi was to actually develop violence maps. And this, during our study, and these maps were actually taken up by the local chiefs because they're saying this will tell us exactly you know where to prioritize our our interventions um, on the issue of Indonesia. Th uh, that is actually spot on. In fact, uh, it, uh, the, a lot of the violence we were finding was 
in organized youths who are actually employed largely in the martial arts groups that were also providing security, that, that, that like some illegal militia, paramilitary characters. And, um, and one way of uh, showing the dominance and uh, confirming that they were indeed uh, the ones who were replacing state as, uh, you know, holding monopoly of violence was to actually, uh, you know, viciously go after each other. <laughs> and uh, you know display the martial arts and actually you know use of arms so yes um if you look at employment uh, and, and even organizing youth as a way of dealing with violence then it, it has to be very specific to i mean i mean in in what sort of um, of areas um uh, are, are we looking at uh, so, so i fully agree with the with your sentiments on that particular issue i think i'll, I'll stop there for now yeah, thanks Anthony. caroline <laughs> Yeah, I just want to make a comment on on the question of governance that you that you talked about, and and in many ways when we talk about governance, we often think about state presence, um, and in many of these um, areas, particularly in peri-urban areas that are growing very quickly, state institution the state reach is is, is almost limited or non-existent, um, and in and and in many ways I. I, I am for the state, of course, um, I, I, and, and I wish it would work very well, but some of the examples of areas that are like Kibera, um, that are impoverished, that have no infrastructure, that have very little state presence in them, um, some of those areas that I've worked in have had the best outcomes in terms of security. And why? And it's about local institutions. When communities come together and t get a stake of the space that they're in, they build communities and forms of regulation that allow people to live in ways, in, in, in ways that are not insecure. And they have ways of dealing with, with violence or, or mitigating or preventing violence. Uh, and, I'm, and here I'm not talking about, you know, uh, necklacing and going on around mob violence and uh, mob justice, but I'm talking about, um, I worked in Maputo for a, for a long time in, in the byros that surround the city. And some of the ways in which those areas are regulated, and it's so sophisticated, and the structures of reporting, et cetera, that are completely outside of the state, but work very well. And, and we need to look at, when we're talking about um, how, we, how, how to respond to some of these things, we, look, we need to look at how we can help build local institutions, in addition to you know, our state institutions, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and that, I feel, is the key. And in the absence of the state, it certainly is one of the solutions that we should um, follow. Thank you. What, yeah. We is that right? <laughs> okay. We have time for one more question. Is there someone who would like to? Yes, back there. Yes. Oh, somebody. Did, did you get? There he is. Uh, Hugh Schwartz um, with the University of Uruguay. Uh, as an economist, I learned a great deal during this presentation, uh, but I have a couple of uh, concerns. Uh, one is um, there were several comments made about policing, and I agree with most of them, but I would comment, uh, is there no study which uh, looks at the areas of different cities which the police have called off bounds, which they wouldn't even police at all? Uh, this differs a great deal, I think, between cities. Um, and the second thing is compensation to the police people, the policemen. Um, in one city in Brazil where uh, police earn approximately what a skilled workman would earn, uh, various certain forms of violence was not high. In another major city of Brazil where the police earned a great deal less than what was earned by a skilled workman, um, violence in the city and violence by police was very high. I don't think that either of these two issues have been considered by the panelists. Well, thank you. Why don't we, why don't we go through and uh, talk about that? It's, it is certainly a governance issue. It's about the lack thereof in certain places in the city 
and um, the effectiveness of police and and <coughs> and how they are how they are trained, how they're paid. Uh, does anyone want to reflect on that in, in their experience? Allison. Okay. Um, well. Um, yeah, there are uh, various experiments in policing going on in Mexico that cross-cut the violence against women issue with the drug trafficking issues. Um, and so it's a little hard to disentangle, you know, uh, because there's such a generalized violence and uh, problem of police being targeted and how police are, and police being corrupted and substituting federal police for local police and militarization of police, you know. So um, in some of the hot spots of gender-based violence, um, there are confounding issues. Um, and uh, in more peacetime um, zones or where, uh, for example, I'm thinking about Brazil, um, one of the ways in which this is addressed is not only professionalization of police and um, addressing the kind of no-go zone problems, but also gendered police in creating women's police forces and specialized reporting mechanisms and stations and uh, the, the kind of the new thing that I'm um, intrigued by and looking into is that in um, uh, in Mexico and also in Brazil, and I was just reading about someplace else, I can't remember, there's a new thing called women's justice centers, um, which for violence against women in the same facility, you have victim services, you have policing, um, you have you know gender sensitive policing, you have medical services, um, you have advocacy, and um, so it seems that not just the compensation of police and the activity of police, but really the form of policing has to change and has to be more integrated with social services for this kind of violence. And there may be lessons in that uh, for other places and for other kinds of violence, for some of the male-on-male uh, youth violence and crime, maybe we need also to look at more integrated kinds of policing. Yes, sir. I, I just want to add briefly on uh, on that. Um, I agree with you there that uh, that uh, the many instances, and we saw this uh, in 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 um, in Delhi, in Nairobi, and 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 um, and um, in in uh, in Patna, that. Um, in a number of these areas, uh, the police almost accept that uh, there are vigilantes and gangs who who are in charge of security in those areas, and 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 um, they more or less uh, leave the gangs, you know, to to keep the peace there. Um, and, and of course, that, that's a problem. Whether whether there's an issue of compensation of the police or not, I would have a lot of um, a lot of questions. Um, I think part of the problem is. Uh, is the police largely only responding to violence when it's reported? And when it's not reported, particularly in the Kenyan case, we're finding that the police were fueling violence. Uh, they would come in, you know, beat up youth, uh, you know, harass women and stuff like that, particularly during political, um, you know, upheavals and so on. So, so the police, incidentally, we did a very serious institutional analysis, and um, people agreed that the police were amongst the most significant in reducing violence, but simultaneously, people identified that the police were the biggest perpetrator of violence in these areas. Yes, I think, I think there's, there's, there's a problem there of, of, of conceptualization. And, and I think there's a problem also of conceptualization of violence itself. The police are waiting for crimes to be reported to them. Uh, while, 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 while violence and uh, our own conceptual study of it, starting from normal conflicts, day-to-day -day conflicts, that are not criminal acts, and, and, and going all the way to, to violence, and some violence acts are not overtly criminal. Um, we defined actually violence as imposition of, um, of one's uh, will on another person unwillingly. So sometimes, I mean, uh, it may not even be clear whether a law has been broken down in, in the statutes. And the quality and the level of understanding of these issues by the police is very shallow. In all the areas, including Santiago de Chile, uh, the issue was show us where the criminal criminals and will arrest them. And the phenomenon we're talking about here is, um, is just a little bit more complex. So I think that's part of, uh, part of uh, you know, the challenge. Mm, thank you. 
Um, yeah, I think when we talk about policing, especially in, in young democracies or in, in developing contexts, um, there's a whole host of problems, um, some of which you've mentioned. It's the lack of compensation, poor training, um, and just an, an inadequacy of, you know, having inadequate skills of dealing in different kinds of, uh, of violence. I mean, look at the Kenyan case in trying to deal with terrorism versus trying to deal with uh, university unrest. Versus, you know, I mean, and, 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 and this is an ongoing kind of um, problem, but one that can be, one that is techni technical, you know. You just get a good, tra you know, good budget, train the police, and, 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 and that will hopefully solve the problem, but I don't think that will solve the problem. I think some of the problems that, 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 that emanate from the poor or lack of policing or whatever is, is a, an inherent lack of trust in the police by communities. And why is this? And, then, and, and I think we have to look at the long durée of a history of, of, a, of, a, of a place. Um, in apartheid South Africa, a black person would run away from when you see the police. You see the, a, a white police on, on, on the corner, you run the other side. Um, 20 years of democracy is not going to improve the levels of trust between people and the police, even if it's a black policeman now on the streets. And, and there are these softer issues that I think we're not good at at, at getting to, and, when, uh, and, and, uh, and, and we're not good at trying, at, at building. And one of the, 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 the huge issues in, in policing, particularly in South Africa, is the fact that there's no level, there are no tr there's no trust between communities. Um, and if there is no trust between communities, they're not, you know, police, the police become kind of non-entities in, 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 in the fight against crime and criminals and criminality. Thank you. And thank you so much. Why don't we give everyone a, a big hand? <laughs> so this should be, this, uh, this seminar should be up on the web in, within a couple of weeks. Is that? Days. Days now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, uh, I think it's an, it would be an excellent teaching thank tool. You. Thank you so much for that. Great. Great job. Mm. It was a great seminar. It's a great, uh, would make a great teaching tool, actually, to get more people together. Like that. Yeah, because people do access these videos, you know, and they show them in class rather than